So I'm Jacob. I'm Chelsea. Um, we are doing, looking at barriers and opportunities in uh, taking cooperative business models in Ontario. And this definitely builds off the last one. There's a lot of organic, small scale agriculture that we looked at. Um, so that, uh, just a quick overview of our methods. We did literature review and we also did some primary research. So we sent out surveys, got some replies, which is awesome. And we went to the Ecological Farmers Associ Association of Ontario. We went to a conference on cooperative networks and what you guys built on uh, is like 50 bucks to go. It wasn't too outrageous. And then there's like some pay what you can tickets, which was nice. So I think the biggest thing with that though is uh, the time away from your farm that's like hinders you the most for uh, financial. Anyways. Uh, so we'll just go over some different business models to just clarify. So these are the four main ones. Sole proprietorship is just your single owner. Um, you know, you make all the money, you tax on that. Partnership can be 50-50, 70-30. You're splitting the profits. Um, you're tax on that again. Corporations like a partnership, but bigger. And it's usually board operated, um, and then there's, you know, CFO, CEO, and then that hierarchical pyramid of operations going down to everyone, and that can be split, you know, like 20-20-20, or someone has, you know, 51%, and then there's three other owners, and it can be publicly traded. Uh, and then there's cooperatives, which is different than these three. These three are definitely capitalists, and their main goal is to maximize profits, and get as big as they can, you know, limit, no limits to growth. Cooperatives are a different ideology where they're more, uh, as Chelsea will get into, but they're owned by the members and it's an equal share for each member, so one member is one vote, uh, generally equal pay. But, uh, okay, um, so cooperatives, um, just a really broad definition is an autonomous association of persons united voluntarily to meet their common economic social and cultural needs and aspirations through a jointly owned and democratically controlled enterprise. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of different kinds of co-ops, like workers' co-ops, housing co-ops, not-for-profits. Uh, we focus mostly on, we have different case studies who have, who are workers' co-ops or not-for-profit, but all of ours focus on agriculture. Um, Jacob already touched on this, but um, the more democratic than other business models. Um, there's one member, one vote, so there's not a big hierarchy. Um, another factor is sweat equity, so everyone puts in the same amount of effort, ideally. And um, autonomy and collaboration of skills, knowledge, and assets. So um, it's good to have your members having an interdisciplinary set of skills, so certain people can take on what they're best at. Um, and then community engagement is also a big one. Um, so the work work with the community, um, seek help from them, and also um, sell to them as consumers. Um, so this is a little diagram that we made. Um, it shows that how um, cooperative members absorb the roles of um, what is usually the middlemen in the conventional value chains. Um, so basically, they absorb the roles of producer and retailer and cut out the middleman and wholesalers um, to get, have a more direct relationship with consumers. Um, so this provides them, oh sorry, so there's a two-way flow between producers, producers and consumers this way, so what the consumers want is communicated to the cooperatives and the cooperatives would ideally give that back. And then we also have a quote from one of our interviewees at the top. Um, yeah, so it's just how they perceive co-ops. Um, so they say that they're democratic, they keep ownership and profits local. Um, there's more opportunities for individuals to be involved in economic um, initiatives. Um, they return patronage dividends to their members, so this keeps money in their pockets. Um, and they also have a social ethic, um, which encourages them to contribute to local communities. Um, so we're going to focus on three case studies that were at the EFAO conference, and they were really awesome. Um, so Turn Soleil and Shaw's Creek are worker co-ops with farms, and then Eat Local Grey Bruce is a kind of an overarching cooperative with a bunch of farmers from Grey Bruce County, and it supplies food.
who uh, takes that products from the farmers and then delivers it or supplies it to consumers in Great Bruce County. Um, it's, it was a really great uh, program that was started uh, just this past March. And they like got this to go up going, they got all this input from farmers, uh, reached out to the community, huge um, like you know, feedback, like people really wanted this because Great Bruce it's it's a uh, low population, huge county, so grocery stores aren't central to people. They love the delivery. Um, yeah, problems with startup money, getting people involved, uh, figuring out where their delivery is going to be, who's delivering. Um, as Jody mentioned, how she fired herself from the board. Their general manager uh, advised the board to fire him in March because startup costs is what's most expensive, and he's part of that startup cost. So the idea is his first year as general manager would be all they need to get uh, self working. So. Uh, Automated, I guess you would say. Um, great initiative. It looks like it's going to continue, so that's awesome to hear. Uh, Shaw's <coughs> Creek and Turn Soleil are both uh, workers' cooperatives, so they grow everything on their farm, try and sell at CSAs or at local markets. Um, Turn Soleil is part of a larger cooperative network, kind of like the Eat Local Grey Bruce, but that gives them access to more CSAs, more farmers' markets. Um, Shaw's Creek doesn't quite have that yet. They're looking for that. They're a younger cooperative, so they have that issue of finding that overarching cooperative network. I should also add that Turn Soleil is from Quebec, which is, uh, as we heard from the last presentation, has a better cooperative network to work within, and there's more emphasis on local food and organic food. Um, yeah, both are great. And that leads into some of their uptake barriers from what we find in the literature and from our surveys and conference. The biggest one is capitalist context. These are really hard programs. They aren't uh, that ideology of uh, there's no limits to growth. Everything has to be uh, bigger and better and more profitable. Um, while that is part of the business model, that's not the main goal. Uh, so, and the other part with that capitalist context is uh, big farms, like as we see now with industrial agriculture, uh, big farms are big enough that they no longer um, need the local support as they once did, so they can just ship to a granary or because it's all monoculture now, uh, mostly. And so these, and then furthermore on that, as these farms are so specialized that they don't need this like, uh, broad community support, because not everyone wants, you know, a thousand pounds of carrots, but if they can sell that specialized, you know, if they specialize in one thing, they can sell it a lot easier wholesale to a large distributor. Um, so yeah, and then that works farther down, just into that trust with people. If you're going into a cooperative, like if you're starting up one with just a workers' cooperative, like, you really have to trust the other person that they're going to work as hard as you, you're not going to have personality issues. Um, you have the same ideologies. Uh, you want to stay in this as long as the other person. Like the other person drops out after five years, that's really difficult to run something without uh, that much work. Uh, money is a big issue. Startup money. Um, big problem with starting these cooperatives is just getting a farm to do it. Uh, you need like half a million just to buy enough land or get your products, right? You, I mean, you can put a mortgage on that or you can rent land. That was the next issue is land. Um, there's laws in Ontario, or policy I guess, where you can't buy solely land unless it's 50 acres or more. Uh, at least around here. And so you have to rent your land or buy a house on that land. And if you're going into it and you already have a property, it can be hard to like move to a different place or have you know, six people move into one house who have never lived together before, try and start this workers cooperative. Again, ideology, um, you want to come at this with people who have the same background. Um, if there's split in ideology, someone wants to go a corporation or a partnership, that, you know, that kind of ruins the whole purpose of the co-op. Um, then connecting with consumers, getting your product to sell. Um, the labor, you have to come with your business cap, your workers cap, your growing food cap, and then again, social justice, everyone 
working the same hours or putting contributing the same amount of work, the same quality of work, and some solutions. Okay, so some solutions that we found, um, starting with the land policy changes. So um, if people could buy smaller plots of land, it would be easier for them to get into farming and to learn how to farm um, and to learn how to farm in like organic or ecological ways. Um, and it's also a good way to um, bring young, younger generations into farming and into cooperatives. Um, another one is connecting with other co-ops to share strategies and knowledge. Um, an example of this was the EFAO conference that we went to. Um, so they shared strategies um, and knowledge and also the EFAO website and like there's a cooperative website as well that share a lot of resources on how to start a co-op, how to maintain it, um, and everything else. Um, also working with the right people, as Jacob sort of mentioned, is really important. You want to make sure that they have um, the same ideologies as you. Um, I, what I thought was really interesting about the case studies we looked at is um, they all really stressed ideology as a central factor, like um, keeping their co-op together. Um, yeah, and also working with the right people is just good to maintain the sweat equity. And also more opportunities for funding. Um, so we were thinking maybe policy changes to support cooperative models um, within the capitalist framework. Um, so um, an example we kind of thought of was if you donate a certain amount of food to a local food bank, you would get like X amount of funding for that. Um, crowdfunding is also um, a way that cooperatives are getting money to start up. Um, and also di like diversifying and maybe selling to co-ops, or, or sorry, using CSAs and things like that, um, which also plays into community engagement. And lastly, uh, public outreach, so education and um, uh, resources to train younger generations, to give them experience and skills in farming and to um, cooperatives. Interesting. References. <laughs> Way to go. Questions? So the, uh, the cooperatives that you uh, um, kind of do your case studies on, how did they get started? Like, how did they attract members? Yeah. Do you know how? Like, yeah, sorry, she's going to uh, The Grey Bruce, the general manager, just literally went door to door okay. and asked people if they would, if this is something they were interested in. Mm -hmm. And then he started finding staff, just whoever was willing to work for, like, cheap, I guess you could say. But yeah. And then just finding places to do work. Um, he had a, him and his wife had, like, a 10 acre farm, like, hobby farm type thing. I think they did a lot of processing and work through there and like storing or keeping vans on their property. So that was a huge benefit to them. The other ones were like, Turn Soleil is just like uh, a bunch of friends in university when they finished, had some money, they all came from farming backgrounds and went into, and uh, the other thing with them was they were all the second or third oldest sibling in the family, so they weren't inheriting the farm they had a farm to inherit from their parents, so they wanted to stay stay in it, but uh, do their own thing. And Shaw's Creek was similar. They just came, a group of friends who wanted to do this, came at it, found a space to do it. And they had to rent land in each case, which they found difficult. Where's that one based? Yeah. Shaw's Creek, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you get a sense from any of your interviews um, why the this given the, the, those number of barriers that it's difficult to make a co-op work in a capitalist system? What's the benefit to the to the farmer? Are they are they ideologically motivated, or do they look at this as a, a better business choice? Or did you get a sense of of that? I think it's a bit of both. I think ideology was huge for a lot of like for most of the case studies we looked at, but from the interviews. Um, they also stress just like keeping money in your pockets and sharing it equally, um, having an equal say in the cooperative. Um, but yeah, ideology was huge. Um, the Shaw's Creek people came together because they're similar, like anarchist ideologies. Um, they also like, I think they 
they talked about their ideologies a lot to make sure that they're definitely on the same page and they focus in, on like social justice and feminism and things that you wouldn't necessarily expect from other business models. Mm -hmm. One other issue was like the one wanted to start, uh, like he's big into black walnuts and butternuts or whatever, and he has to send them away to get them processed and then have them come back. And it's just like an extra cost, so he starts his own with a few other nut growers. It's just like removing that wholesaler middleman and then just more money in your pocket. And keeping things local is the other big thing. Did you have a sense of the strength of cooperatives um, across the country other than Quebec? Uh, Our one. framework was just Ontario, and then we sort of left out of it to get to Quebec, so we don't think. Mm, like, in Ontario, it's like growing stronger, especially up north. Um, there's a lot of them <laughs> popping up. Um, just because things are so far apart, it's easy yeah. for like, not easy, but it's like easy for people to buy into it and yeah. want to do it. Um, the next stage is like actually getting the food to people yeah. and people paying for it or paying enough to keep it in business. Mm -hmm. so. so there's some interesting connections here with like the discussion about food hubs last week as well. Yeah. 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 Sure. Great job. Final questions? No?